Well, I'm glad to be sharing with you this morning, but I have to admit something to you as we look at our passage there in Ephesians 5 and chapter 6. Today's message was the hardest of all of the Ephesian messages that I've had to prepare this week. I struggled this week. Not because I didn't have anything to say, but because I was like a lot of you as Sunday school teachers. I can cover this passage in a month, but to do it in 30 minutes, that's almost impossible. But I'm going to try. I thought about this because it talks about husbands and wives and wives and husbands and parents and children and children and parents and people who work and the people they work for. And there's so many messages to go. And it's a passage full of God's instructions and expectations about the most important relationships of our lives. But as I thought and as I prayed, I realized there's a key to understanding what God is teaching us. Now, I'm going to call time out again because we just got to recognize Miss Mary, but I just saw Penny Moss is with us this morning. Penny, welcome back. We have missed you since you've been gone. <laughs> now we can really have church. <laughs> There's a key to understanding what God is teaching us in all of these passages that we're looking together. When we look at, so husbands, how do you treat your wives? So wives, how do you relate to your husbands? Children, how do you deal with your parents? Parents, how do you raise your children? How do you, in the most important relationships of your life, do what is right? And here's the key to becoming that man or that woman, that uh, husband, that father, that wife, that mother, that child. This is the key to it all. And the key is simple. It all begins with Jesus. That's the bottom line. It all begins with Jesus. Throughout this passage, you're challenged to live for Christ, to reveal Christ in the way you live with one another, to use Christ and the church as a model for every really important relationship. So today I want to talk about how do you have really godly relationships? Because that's really what it's all about. As you read through this passage and you look together at what the Bible is saying, you recognize the Bible is talking about how do you have really strong, really positive, really real, really faithful relationships with one another. And this is information that you need no matter who you are, no matter what age you're at, no matter what stage of life you're in. You may be here today and the idea that you're going to be married someday is as far away as you can possibly imagine, but you're relating to your parents. You may be here today and you've been married for 50 years and you're thinking there's nothing else left for me to learn. I've already known it all. You may be here in all kinds of situations. Some of us may be here and we're thinking the relationships I have are the very strongest relationships of all. Others are here and, and you say, you know, the honest truth is if I were honest, there's some places where we're struggling right now where maybe things are not as strong as they ought to be in my marriage. Maybe I'm not getting along with my kids the way I know I should. No matter what, I tell you, the key is Jesus. And that's what the Bible is telling us in Ephesians chapter 5, it is telling us that when we build our lives, when we build our homes, when we build our relationships upon the rock that is Jesus, the rock that we just heard about, then he will be and teach us to be everything that we're called to be. So this morning, let's take a few minutes and let's look together at what the Bible has to say. And this is what it says. It says, building strong relationships begins with your own walk with Christ, your own walk with Jesus. You want a strong relationship no matter where you are? If you're married, if you're thinking about being married, if you're planning to be married, if someday you might be married, if you're relating to other people and you love them and you care about them, it all begins with your own walk with Jesus. Today's passage is built upon a simple assumption that it is speaking to people who are serious followers of Christ. Everything that Ephesians has to say to us about Christian relationships, about godly relationships, begins with that simple assumption that the people I'm talking to belong to Jesus. In fact, everything in Ephesians 5 and 6 falls apart unless people are walking with the Lord. Paul is giving an assumption that 
I am writing to people, I am talking to people, and they have a serious, rock-hard relationship with Christ. How hard, how rich, how real, what did the Bible say? We read it together just a few moments ago in verse 30. It says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body, his flesh and his bones. What is he saying? He is saying you are organically connected to Jesus. Your connection with Jesus is so real, it might as well be flesh and bone. It might as well be of the same person because you have this deep, strong connection with Christ. And strong relationships always begin there. They always begin with people who are committed to Jesus. You know, over the years, I've talked to folks about this whole concept of unequally yoked. Have you ever heard that concept, unequally yoked, that says believers should marry believers, that you shouldn't join together with folks who don't know Jesus? And that's not because the Bible is saying you need to stay away from those people. Those people are bad. Those people are wrong. It's simply saying you come at life from two different perspectives. Interestingly enough, that whole unequally yoked thing applies even more in chapter 6 because it's really talking about who do you do business with more than who do you marry. It's talking about making sure that you are with people who have common values with you. Common values. And the most important of all is this organic, personal, deep relationship with Jesus. And here's the thing, because if you don't have that, nothing else in this passage makes any sense whatsoever. You know, the Bible says, uh, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. Boy, that is beautiful, profound language. As long as you know Jesus. But the truth is, what good does it tell, take to tell a lost man to love his wife the way Christ loved the church? That makes no sense to him. What are you talking about? The church is that building down the street over there. That's that place on Lakeshore Drive. How am I supposed to love my wife the way God loves a building? What does this mean? A wife who doesn't know Christ is going to be offended by biblical words about submission because all she hears is somebody's trying to buy me up and take control of me and tell me I've got to be subject to them and I'm not taking orders from anybody. But when you know the Lord, when you say these words as a believer, it becomes a great responsibility. When you say those words as a believer, suddenly they make sense because they're all about knowing Christ and loving other people in the spirit of Christ. And it's not a place where anybody's in danger and it's not any place where a person is being oppressed. It is where people are lo learning to love each other the way you need to be loved. And that comes out of a relationship with Jesus. And so sometimes you say, I just don't know what's going on at my house. I don't know why my wife doesn't love me the way she used to. I don't know why my husband's not showing love for me the way he should. I don't understand why my kids are being so rebellious. I don't understand why my parents just seem to hold me down. I don't understand. And I say to every one of us, the first thing you need to do is ask the question, so how are things with the Lord? What is the condition of my walk with Jesus? Before you talk to the Lord about anybody else, what I'm saying is if you want to build strong relationships, you begin with yourself. 
And beginning with yourself means you need to sit down and take a serious look and say, what is my relationship with Jesus? Is it what it ought to be? Am I walking with him the way I should? Am I open to Christ and Christ's leadership in my life? Am I seeking his guidance and am I asking him to show me the way? Because so many of the things that we think of as problems in our lives and problems in our relationships, those things would take care of themselves if it started, if you started out by saying, what is my relationship with Jesus? And because I have a strong relationship with Jesus, I want to relate to the people I love the way he wants me to do it, the way he's taught me to do it, the way he has shown me the way. I'll never forget, several years ago, I was performing a wedding at Brentwood Baptist Church in Brentwood, Tennessee. It was one of those times when I recognized just how big I was in this world because the groom had grown up in my church. I'd known him since he was a little guy, and he'd grown up to be a fine young man of six foot seven inches tall. I was his pastor, the bride's pastor, Trisha's pastor was Mike Glenn, the pastor still at Brentwood Baptist Church. Mike's about 6'4". And there I stood. <laughs> but I'll never forget what happened during that service. In the middle of that service, Mike was talking to them about what this very passage has to say. And he looked at Luke and he said, Luke, I want you to understand what the Bible is telling you before you marry this young woman. He said, the Bible is saying that you were supposed to love your bride the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He said, do you understand what that means, young man? He said, that means that if you marry this girl, then you've got to be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to take care of her. You've got to be willing to suffer for her. You've got to be willing to do without. You've got to be willing to sacrifice. You've got to be willing to do anything. He said, if it takes it, it means you've got to be willing to die to protect her. Are you willing to do that? And then he said to him, because that's not my words. Those are the words of God. And as he said those last three words, he was poking him in the chest. And that young man was rocking backwards. And his eyes got as big as saucers. And it all struck home. Why did it strike him so powerfully? Because both of those young people are committed followers of Jesus. And he recognized the truth in what he was being told. Am I saying lost people can't love their wives and take care of their families? No, but I am saying this. They will never have the spiritual tools that only Christ can provide. And this morning, if you want to be everything your family and the people you love need you to be, then you need to know things are right with Jesus. You need to make it first priority to cultivate your relationship with him. Because if you bypass your walk with Christ, inevitably, every other relationship is going to suffer. If you take Jesus to the side in the midst of your home, things are going to change, and it's not going to be good. But if you nurture your relationship with him, if you make sure he comes first, that every other relationship will be blessed. Sometimes we are prone to say in the midst of life and all of its demands, well, I wish I could give more time to the Lord, but I have so many other places I have to be. I have so many other things I need to do. I have things I need to do with my family. I have plans and schedules and things. But what I know is this, the more you make sure that time with him is sacred, the more those relationships don't suffer, they grow rich. Pay attention to Christ before any other responsibility or relationship. And then the second thing he says in Ephesians is this. He says, determine to reveal the love of Christ. Not only do you take care of your relationship with Christ, but then you determine, I'm going to show that love for Christ in every other relationship. Once you settle what the Lord is doing in you, it's time to let the love of Jesus shine through you. You need to hear the phrases that Paul uses in Ephesians as he talks about the most important relationships of your life. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church. 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What am I saying? Every time Paul deals with a major relationship, he always ends it by saying, and the Lord is at the center of, of this. Because every one of these commands will be one of two things in your life. When the Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children. It will be one of two things. It will be an obligation and a burden to bear. Well, I guess I'll do it because the Bible says I have to. Or it will be an opportunity to bless the people you love the most. You will read those words and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know. This is getting too tight, too strict, too hard. Or you will say, Wow, what a great chance to bless the people that matter to me most. What makes the difference? Love. Love in the name of Jesus. Not that ooey-gooey kind of love you see in the movies. You know that kind of love where you meet somebody and you fall in love with them and you marry them and only 90 minutes has gone by? Not that kind of love. The kind of love that is committed for the long haul. We are commanded to love each other with the agape love of Christ. I like the way that Tony Evans describes this agape love in, in his book, Kingdom Disciples. I, I liked it so much, I just want to read it to you this morning. Well, listen to what he says. He says, the biblical definition of the Greek word for love, agape, is compassionately and righteously pursuing the well-being of another. It is placing someone else's need and advancement higher than they may even set it for themselves, and certainly higher than you set your own. It doesn't have anything to do with liking someone. In fact, you can love people you don't even like because love is an intentional choice to do good for another. Love is an intentional choice to do good for another. We are committed to love each other in just that way. When you love somebody, you try to bring the presence of Jesus into their lives, and that means you do whatever you have to do to make sure they understand how much you care because that's how much he cares. You live for, for him in a way that they can understand. And here's the thing. Sometimes love is easy and sometimes love is hard, but it always comes from the same motive. I want God's best for your life. If I had to render everything Paul has said in Ephesians 5 and 6 into one sentence, that would be the sentence. I want God's best for your life. And so I will show his love to you in the way you understand the best. And that's what the Bible is saying. You take care of your relationship with Christ. You det determine to reveal the love of Christ. And then you make it your goal to build them up. I will build up the people I love. In every relationship Paul describes, he's challenging husbands and wives, parents and children, leaders and followers to all do the same thing. We are called to make each other more than we were before we experienced real love. When somebody has loved you, when they have loved you well, when they have loved you for a long time, when they have loved you with great commitment, when they have loved you with the love of Christ, you will not be the same person anymore. It will make you somebody new. And if you're loving each other the way you should, there's a trail of growing believers all along your pathway. One of the ways you can determine whether you're living as a person of love, whether it's talking about where you live and in your home or whether it's talking about where you work or who you touch or where you're at in church or whatever, is wherever you go, your life is having influence. Wherever you go, people are becoming more like Christ, not because you're intentionally saying, here's the test and you better pass it, but because that's the influence of loving lives. 
I've messed up a lot of ways in my life, but there's one thing that we seem to have gotten right. My kids grew up in a pastor's home. All their life long, they grew up with their dad as pastor of First Baptist Church. And today they're grown, and today they don't live anywhere close to me. And they both love Jesus, and they both like church. And that is so good to know. And some of the reason for that is because of how Judith and I raised them. But an awful lot more of it is because of people who took seriously this idea of being a loving influence for Christ in their lives. They grew up in church families that knew them and encouraged them and challenged them in their spiritual walk. So many people poured the love of Jesus into their lives. And I will forever be grateful for church families that took that name seriously and loved one another. There are so many things I love about First Baptist Church. But one of the things I love the most is every Sunday morning when we have our fellowship time and I watch the children of this church talking to grown-ups of every age and background because they know they're loved. Because they know this is a great place and that everybody's going to care about them. And they will be special. It's incredible how you can influence someone's life if your goal is to lift them up and make them more than they would have been without Jesus loving them through you. That's a long sentence, but it's a good one. If your goal is to make them more than they would have been without Jesus loving them through you. And that's what I see in Ephesians 5 and 6, that every command given in this passage is one of choosing to build one another up. It's about how you treat them and never how they've treated you. In other words, we are called to have the mind and the heart of Christ. So how do you do it? How do you become that person that Christ has called you to be? How do you love the way Christ called you to love? Well, the whole secret is found in these passages, the verses we've read together this morning. So if you didn't hear anything else I've said today, Hear this, in every relationship that Paul describes in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6, there's one thing that is always in common. He is calling us to step out first. Not one time does he say, this is about how somebody else is going to treat you. It's all about, this is how you're going to treat somebody else. There's nothing in here that says, husbands, make your wives submit to you. There's nothing in here that says, wives, you make sure your husband loves you the way Jesus loved the church. There's nothing in there that says, children, obey your parents as long as you agree with them. Or parents, make sure that your children understand how worthless they are because they have no value other than being obedient to you. There's nothing in here that says, this is all about how you treat me. It's all about how do I treat you. And so it says, husbands love. Wives give honor. Children obey. Parents build up your children. Every time, in every relationship, it is saying, you be the one that goes first. You know, when I was a kid in school, we did the same thing I bet you did. You'd see somebody and you thought they were pretty special and so you would do the... You would sit down in class one day, and you would write that note. What did that note say? I like you if you like me. Check one. <laughs> did you ever do that? Yes, no. And depending on what you checked is what I did next. Jesus never said check one. What he said is this. I love you. I love you just the way you are. I love you even before you've repented. I love you when there's nothing in your life that's lovable. I love you, and I'm calling you to myself, and this is what I believe. If I love you and you trust me, I'm going to change you. 
Oh, we need to have that same attitude toward one another. I love you, and I'm going to keep on loving you, and I'm going to keep reaching out to you, and it's not about what you do with me. It's about what I do with you. And the more I reach out to you, the more I'm going to realize God is changing us both, and we're going to love one another. And that's what the key is all about. It's all about trusting the love of Jesus and showing the love of Jesus and being the first one to do it. And that's what God calls us to do. So I guess my question to you this morning before anything else is that question, do you know the love of Jesus in your life? Do you have that personal relationship with him? If not, maybe today is the day when you can surrender and receive that grace and that forgiveness and that love that only he can offer. And I'll be here in a minute, and Rich will be here in a minute, and either one of us would love to introduce you to Jesus. All you got to do is come as we sing our invitation to him. Or maybe you're here, and you need a place where you can grow and know Christ, and this is the place you want to be. And God is calling you and saying, you need to be part of a church family, and this is the one. And today, you need to plant your membership at First Baptist Church as a believer. Or maybe God's dealing with you about some other things. Maybe some issues and personal things in your life that you just want to resolve and settle. And today's a good day to do it. Is there a decision you need to make? We're going to stand in just a second. We're going to sing our invitation hymn. It's going to be your opportunity to come. Will you do it? Let's stand together. Let's sing.